All right, prayer and home groups. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. This is found in James chapter 5. Now, we, we haven't gotten as heavy into home groups as often is the case by the time we might have a lesson like this. And so we're like, we're talking about prayer, and maybe we haven't had as, as, in, as intense a prayer life within the home groups yet, but it is something that we want to get to, where, where a home group is praying for the needs of one another, like it's mentioned in this verse, but is also praying for the lost, right? That they bring the names of people that are, that, that are on their heart, that they know, do not know Jesus, and as the group begins to pray for that per, uh, those persons, person or persons. The power of prayer is unquestionable. Well, I think maybe some of us sometimes do question it, but truly it is unquestionable. Lost souls come to Christ. Sick bodies are made whole. Broken marriages are restored. And financial lack becomes provision when fervent prayer is released. If we, I say we, if we are not experiencing that, to the fullest degree that we could be is because we're still not accessing prayer as transformative, as getting into a deeper relationship with the Father and engaging Him on these matters. There are different types of prayer, each with a specific function. One of them is fellowship prayer, where we spend an intimate time alone in God's presence, enjoying His company, drawing near to Him, which I, I kind of touched on that in a sense with this transformative thing. We're going to talk about another type of prayer in this lesson called task prayer. In other words, we have a task that we're trying to accomplish, which is to bring souls into the kingdom of God. All right. One, task prayer is prayer for a specific goal, in a particular, a goal that requires divine intervention. Intervention. In other words, we need God to get in there. And of course, as I've already stated, if God's not in there, it's really not going to happen anyway. A, task prayer is different from fellowship prayer. Elijah prayed both effectually and fervently. As we read in James chapter 5, the story is actually in 1 Kings chapter 18 as well. He bowed seven times toward the Mediterranean Sea and did not stop until he saw the cloud rising. And he began to pray for rain to return. This is a task prayer. He's praying for something to happen. A, uh, the minister, and again, not everybody would know this guy, perhaps, maybe you do, Paul Yongi Cho, a pastor in Korea, who had a church of over a million, teaches the difference. He prays through the tabernacle prayer each day in his private prayer time, using the various parts of the tabernacle's reference points, the bread of the presence, God for provision, the, the, the lamp stand for, you know, God illuminate my path, give me direction, stuff of that nature. And when he reaches for a holy of holies, he prays task prayer over areas in which he needs miraculous intervention. That we need God to move. Somebody needs to get saved. Somebody needs to get some miraculous healing. I'm going to be very bold here in just a second. We we just we 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 uh, Pastor Bob was talking, and one of uh, John and uh, actually it was Amanda. I want to say Amanda. I know she wasn't here, but they brought up about their grandfather who's battling cancer. Can I tell you, sometimes when we have situations like that, in the state that we're in right now, we doubt. God, is God going to really heal him? And there's all kinds of factors. Well, he's, a, he's an older gentleman. He's not necessarily a young guy. How, how deep has it gotten in his life? All this kind of stuff. We know God can heal, but will he? That's the question, right? This is something that requires divine intervention. You hear what I'm saying? It needs, it's only going to happen if God gets involved. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that doctors can do. God has to do it. But the question becomes, are we praying for God? God, touch his life. Yes. Get him out of that sick bed, right? Here. Come on, church. I mean, when we walk around, with you, we talk about the story of Jesus. Again, here's my, my diverting again. He was doing that all over the place. 
Right? He's walking along, and there is a group coming out of a city carrying the casket of a young man who is dead. And he tells them to stop, and he, oh, I don't remember all the details of it, basically open up, boom, the boy's alive. Huh? You hear what I'm saying? This is the God we serve. And he's, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because some of you guys know what we're singing on Sunday. He's the same God today. <laughs> Come on. B, the prayer of the persistent widow. Persistent widow illustrates task prayer. Right? Jesus taught in Luke 18 this, this story about prayer and not giving up, being tenacious. That I'm not letting go until I get what I came for. Yes. This widow comes to this judge who doesn't care. He doesn't care what happens to this woman. It's not important to him. He's got his own things and he's just, you know, in his own life. But because she kept coming at him and at him and at him till she got an answer. And sometimes I think there is a, there's a certain ignorance about what exactly is the process for us. And it's not about it being a process, mind you. It's about what is it God has... We need to press in till we know that God has spoken what he wants to accomplish in that situation. Oh, we can pray, heal cancer. It sounds spiritual. It sounds Christ-like. But unless we pray with a fervency... Until we know that we know that we know that God has spoken a promise over that situation, we should not give up. Amen. She had success because she would not release him until he gave her the answer she desired. Yeah. You mean that God might actually answer a prayer that might not entirely be exactly what he wanted to have happen? Oh, I believe so. It's where is your faith? And we're talking again. We're his children. It's kind of like nagging dad. Dad, do this. Do this, dad. Like a hammer hitting a nail. She just kept on pounding and pounding and pounding until she got her answer. And basically, basically says, I'm doing this because if I don't, she's going to keep on bothering me until, she, uh, until I do. How, and it says, how much more will your heavenly father respond to those who are his kids? Yeah. Huh? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? C, prayer for souls is task prayer. Now, just as much as we need to pray for this healing, we need to have the same fervency for those who do not know the Lord. People that we work with, people that are in our family. My wife and I, we have three kids. I don't know where Gideon is entirely, but the other two aren't walking with God. If they were to pass away and where they're at right now, and I don't mean to say that and be judgmental, I don't know if they would make it over to the other side with the Lord. And how serious am I, how fervent will I be to seeking God for an answer to that? Two, now we're going to talk about something that's probably never been introduced to you guys here. It says... You can use the prayer of three. I'm going to go into what that is in just a second. Prayer of three to pray in the harvest. And this is something that you would kind of put as a part of your home group. Maybe, and probably when we have our next home groups um, shortly, maybe at halftime. That was a joke right there. <laughs> Sorry. We would pray for those. It says, select the names of three. This is A. Select the names of three unsaved people. In other words, before you even go over and talk to somebody about the Lord, the first thing you should be doing is praying for them. Now, I can tell you, sometimes driving a Uber, that can be a little difficult because you never know, know who's going to be in your car. But God does. But God does. God, I, I mentioned, I, I think I mentioned about the guy who was a missionary in uh, India who sought God and prayed, God, give me four souls a day. Four souls a day. Wow. Obviously, he did not know who those four souls were going to be before he encountered them. But he started witnessing and would win four people to the Lord every day. So I think it's possible. I think it's possible for us to catch the idea, God, even if we start small, 
I'm going to really start small. Here, I'm going to give you another one. One, one soul a week. That, that's so far below the four a day, right? <laughs> Mathematically speaking. God, give me one soul a week. Hallelujah. One person that I will encounter and talk to who will give his life to you. Come on now. So in the prayer of three, as we, as we list certain unsafe people in, the, in this home group. So I'm telling you right now, we have home group next time. We're going to stop for a moment. We're going to say, okay, I want some specific people that you really feel God is speaking to you about that need to know the Lord. I'm obviously not, if we have 20 people in there and we're looking for three names, not everybody's going to have somebody. But somebody's going to say, you know what? I really, need, I really believe God is wanting so-and-so to come to know him. I've, I've, been, I've been just in prayer. I've been feeling God speaking to me about that person. All right? And we're going to, and the idea is to zero in in praying for those people that we begin to pray. I was, as I was reading in the prayer book, it shared a story about a guy in England. Of course, this is back in the day, right? A guy in England was praying for mission houses in China. He never went to China, never saw the missions. But he got a list of like these places and he would pray for this mission and, and then he would pray for this mission and then he would pray for like a list of about 10 missions. And they said years later when they began to examine the, the, the mission work there that they saw that there was a progression in how the mission work went. That first this mission opened and began to prosper and then this mission opened up and began to prosper in exactly the order that he was seeking God for. Can God move? Yes. And we're saying, God, go before us. God, open the door. God, begin to, to, to soften that heart. God, begin to speak to them even before I come around. The first step in this prayer is, oh, here's a tough one. As a home group of all the sea, fast one day a week for those three people. God, I'm committing myself to that day, whatever day I choose, that I'm going to commit myself not only to fast, but I'm going to pray specifically for that, those three people. I'm going to lift them up to you. I'm going to spend my prayer time during the day and multiple times throughout the day, lifting them up to you throughout the day to break the power the enemy has over them so that the Holy Spirit and the, and the good news can penetrate. Number two, second step C, quote, Scripture daily over the three. And we're going to give, I'm going to give you some examples. Example number one, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Lord, I command the blinding spirits, because 4.4 4 talks about how we're, their eyes are blinded, right? I command the blinding spirits over whomever to release their mind and that the light of the gospel of Christ would shine unto them. Why we use the word? That was 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Another example, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Lord, you desire that all men to be, or should be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Let your will be done in and give them repentance. 2 Timothy 2, 25. Lord, give this person repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that they would come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil. So I use the word to pray over these individuals, right? I'm fasting. I'm speaking the word over them. D, the third step, discern their spiritual needs. Satan has certain strongholds in lost people. God, what is it in these people that needs to be broken so that they'll open up? The Holy Spirit will reveal. The Holy Spirit will give, him, will give wisdom, they could be wrapped up in intellectualism. They're too smart for their riches, so to speak. Disappointment in their life. Confusion about truth. Some sort of addiction or any other area which is hindering them from hearing the gospel. I'm sorry, yeah, discern their spiritual needs. E, fourth step, invite them to a private time. Now, of course, not all the home group people have, can do that for every individual, right? But somebody's going to bring it. Let's say, for example, 
we have home group. Paul says his friend Billy Bob needs the Lord. And we're fasting. And we're quoting scripture over them. And we're asking God to give discernment of what their needs are. And then Paul will, will hey, let's go out for coffee. You want to do lunch this today? Whatever it might be after a period of time. And, and it specifically says here, uh, a three-week period. There's a three-week period that we're praying for this person. Get some private time to talk. You don't necessarily have to witness to them in that moment. But you do need to connect. And maybe you have a connection with them. I understand that. But so maybe that will be an easier step to talk to them about the Lord because you already have a relationship. But the idea is to talk to them about God. The idea is to develop the relationship so that they're open to the gospel. And how are we going to know that they're open to the gospel? Because we've been seeking God. And it's even God's greater desire for it to happen than it is for yours. Fifth step, F. Invite them to a second meeting. Let them know that you're praying for them. Ask them if there's something in their life that they would like prayer for. I've often mentioned, I think that that's often an easy door to open in people's lives. Just about everybody has something that they would appreciate. They may not even have the same faith, but they have no problem you praying for them. And through prayer, your home group will not only fill up, but we'll probably have to start more home groups to make room for those that come in. And G, the last step. Now we say this is the last step. Isn't this funny? Bring them to church. So I think sometimes we've got it backwards. And I know Pastor Bob likes to establish uh, events to bring people to church to help that facilitate that, pro that process, that progress of them coming to know the Lord, right? But it doesn't have to work that way. Yeah, one avenue. So this is the vision for souls and home groups. And unless a home group is winning souls, the vision that it has will probably not last. That's its purpose. To build each other up and to bring in the lost. Every home group should be committed to winning souls. And new converts should be brought to the church, as we just mentioned, so they can publicly acknowledge the step that they've taken in their life. Be water baptized. And even in, attend an encounter, which we need to get on the stick and have another one soon. To connect them to the church. For them to develop relationships in the church. Listen, prayer is the key to seeing the lost come to Christ. Yes. And let's be real. We... we it's not so much that we don't pray, maybe, but maybe sometimes we're just wandering around aimlessly in what we're praying. We have a need, so we bring it to God. We know we're supposed to thank God a little bit, praise Him here and there and this and that. But He wants to engage us in a relationship. And he wants us to catch the spirit of His heart for people. And we can use the prayer of three... And they're talking about three people, obviously. It's kind of like targeting three people at a time. Somebody gets saved, man, we put another name in the, in the bucket, as it were. So that we'll concentrate our efforts into this task, this praying task. Any home group will grow when the prayer of the three is used as a compassionate tool of ministry. In other words, we're, we're plowing up the ground ahead of us. It provides a spiritual focus and an easy-to-follow plan of reaching out to the lost. You know, sometimes it's good to, okay, what can I do? I don't even know what to do, right? There's a lot of things we have to still learn. I know we're, we're talking about, and, and again, I know we talked about this before uh, uh, the class tonight, about what's the next class that we will jump into after we finish this level of things. And I, and, and I kind of feel, I kind of feel that prayer might actually be one of those things, but I have to take the time to kind of develop the lessons and cover material, kind of like with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was really led by the Holy Spirit, even though we, we will probably very likely make that a regular uh, component for future generations that come into the church. Why? Because they all need to hear about the Holy Spirit, and they all need to know the Holy Spirit, be led by the Holy Spirit. And the same thing with prayer, right? I'll be the first to say, 
We all have things that we need to learn about praying more effectively, about really engaging the Father in relationship, huh? catching his spirit. Amen? And that's really our, our, our hope and prayer for home groups. We're, we're just at the beginning. We're all getting together as one. And it's not so much that we're trying to divide up the camps and stuff, but we're all a part of the same vision. So Ben's over here doing something with some group, right? And they're bringing people in. Paul's over here uh, doing something with some of them. And maybe Marilyn's over here doing it with some kind of group, right? And we're all bringing people in. And then we come here on a Sunday and, and we introduce the new, the new members of the family, right? It's like you, you maybe, I mean, if you were in church, of course, when you had your baby, some people had them before they got saved, I get it. But like when we would have kids, the baby, and you'd bring the baby in. Come on, think about it, ladies. You know, you know what, especially what that's like. You bring the baby to church. It's like everybody wants to see the baby, right? Everybody wants to uh, goo 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 and you know pinch its ch the cheek and you know say goo goo gaga or whatever. We're all get excited about the new life in the church. Listen. Even beyond that, the real life that God is looking for is new souls. And can I tell you something? When you get new people in the church, it invigorates the older people. We're all the older people here. It invigorates the older people in the church. We all want to be a part of that. We all want to share the good things of God with them. Right? When they're struggling, when they need prayer, when they need this, or they just want to have a relationship, we all want to be a part of that. It invigorates us. And here's the thing. There's nothing more rewarding or satisfying for the purpose that you are in, here in life than doing that kind of work with people. Seeing their lives transformed by the power of God. 